we are live good evening all welcome to i focus online for the 355th episode 30th in the oculus plus module today we have with us our very own dr savri desai from hinduja hospital mumbai to speak to us on orbital excentration indications procedure and complications it gives us immense pleasure to introduce dr savri to you all presently she is a consultant oculoplasty orbit ocular oncology and facial aesthetic surgery at the pd hinduja hospital and medical center khad mumbai and at dwa eye center she is a gold medalist in ophthalmology from the prestigious gs medical college and the kem hospital she also has a fellowship in oculoplasty orbit ocular oncology from the prestigious lvpai hyderabad and she has a course to her name in facial aesthetics with Dr. Stephen Bosniak and Dr. Marian from New York. She is an honorary consultant at the prestigious Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, and is instrumental to establish the ocular oncology protocols at the hospital. The positions held by her in the past have been: she has been a treasurer of the Ocular Plastic Association of India since 2021, a joint organizing secretary for the annual OPAI conference. She has been editor for two years for the official newsletter of OPAI called the Ideas. To her credit, she has the best paper orbit at the APAO AIOS 2013, the prestigious Dr. Gangadhar Sundar Award for the Young Ocular Plastic Surgeon at the OPAI 2013, the best paper award at AIOC 2015, the best International Thyroid Eye Disease Symposium Award at Singapore 2019. She has. numerous publications to her name she is a vibrant personality she loves teaching and presenting her work through scientific papers publications and surgical videos it's a pleasure to have you ma'am thank you so much that was a very uh, generous uh, introduction and uh, we could have deleted a little bit so it is my pleasure to uh, have a talk on uh, eye focus and uh, I would really like to thank uh, Dr. Santosh for sort of carrying his legacy through these online, which we never had during our training, and that it's easy access to all and to all residents. So, having with that, let's start. So, share my screen. Yes, ma'am. Is that good? Are we good? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please feel to interrupt me in between. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, may I request uh ah. to you speak a bit louder, ma'am? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I usually yeah. think I'm too loud, so now I'm trying to be a little less loud, and you're telling me so good. So I'll go back. So I just thought it was fun to call it the A B C D of the exaggeration. So first, we're gonna start with the. Uh, So I just want to play this video, and I'm sure many of you have seen it. But there was a big discussion we had in our uh, OPD because I was telling my patient, uh, residents especially about this. So that is probably the most famous exaggerated uh, orbit we've ever seen. The famous uh, North God four, uh, and it was just in his sister who sliced his eye in one shot. Either uh, it was a really clean total exaggeration which came out with all the contents which we'll come to, or that's a really badly done makeup job. And uh, we kept discussing as to how uh, you know they managed to exaggerate him when they could have at least done a simple enucleation uh, with a sword. So that was just to start it on a slightly funny note. But uh, well, actually, this is a type of a total exaggeration which they try to depict. So coming to the actual thing, so when we think of all these images or see these images, uh, well, what we really think of is a type of amputation. It's mutilating. It's disfiguring. Uh, there is a concept that everything has lost when you've lost uh, the eye, which looks like this. And is there any hope for further rehabilitation? So, what is orbital exaggeration? 
Orbital exenteration is basically really defined as the surgical removal of all the orbital contents, including the periorbita, the extraocular muscles, the eyeball, the surrounding soft tissues, uh, which also include the fat, and if required, any of the walls of the orbit. So this was first actually described by Bartish way back in, 19, in 1583. And there is actually a picture I found from the archives in one of the journals where he's actually showing that he's done doing it. Well, obviously, uh, the gentleman is tied down because of the lack of anesthesia. But it was actually the first publication that really occurred was in the 20th century. A guru who actually published it, we were talking about an orbito sinus exenteration. So that's just a little trivia because uh, we all love trivia and you never know when, in which conference and in which quiz this ever might come helpful. So what is exenteration will come be spoken about and how do we do it is the main crux of this. Uh, given that we are all postgraduates and we also have a bunch of postgraduates, what we really do is we just divide it into the slides into or the presentation into how you would really like to actually answer our format a paper or get a case which may have a potential question and answer on exenteration of the types of uh, radical surgeries. So coming to indications broadly divided, we usually divide them into malignant tumors which can be primary, which can be secondary, metastatic. Uh, in these, they can be further divided into uh, either eyelid, uh, ocular surface, intraocular or orbital which we'll come to. Then you have benign tumors, which are usually not really tumors, but really life-threatening orbital inclinations, which have you know filled up the whole socket, are a painful. There's loss of vision. Uh, there is a possibility of encroaching into the orbital uh, optic canal and causing bone destruction in some cases. Of course, there's life-threatening infections as fungal, which now uh, we all know about, which will come to, and trauma. So. I put this comparative just to give a perspective to the to everybody when we're talking about indications. So if you look on the left side, we have 1996, which basically talks about secondary tumors, which is eyelid. Okay, in a, uh, num the number of cases, they found that the highest was an eyelid tumor. Going down, you can see other primary tumors such as RMS, neurogenic, fibrocytoma, vascular tumors. Then, of course, further down, lacrimal uh, tumors and lymphomas and the inflammations are released. There's really not much trauma that we're talking about here. And this was a review of 429 cases. But if you look here, in a 23-year report, I actually like this because number of patients were slightly lesser, but it still came down to, again, eyelid tumors, globe tumors. Again, really non-monioplastic was barely a small number. Now let's jump to this uh, paper. The reason I put this is because it's actually a paper with not such a large number, but what I put it for our interest is because it's a combination of uh, a paper done in uh, uh, data collected in the US, in Canada, in Australia, and we still end up coming back to the same thing, lid neoplasms, conjunctal neoplasms, or vital neoplasms, and trauma really goes down very low on the list. So, this was the percentages that we're talking about is uh, done by Shields, uh, in which he's published, they've published it on a uh, technique called eyelid sparing, which we'll be coming to. But the reason I put these with images is because this is the trend that I see in Mumbai at Hinduja over the last 15, 17 years that I've been here. And this is kind of what is follows. But the game changer was, of course, COVID, which we'll come to later. So this is a gentleman with a recurrent squamous cell carcinoma of the eyelid and carancle with a frozen orbit. So there is not much congestion and required an exenteration. The second thing what we saw was ocular tumors, which is, I put a picture of orbital uveal melanoma, which is not really the commonest. So personally, in Hinduja, we don't get orbital RBs. But I do know my colleagues who do get in the north especially a lot of orbital RBs. We tend to see less. They come to us pretty much when we are still intraocular. And he said that the indication for RMS because of the chemotherapy and orbital RBs because of the treatment because of chemo and then radiation. We are trying, we've moved away significantly from doing uh, exenteration for these uh, cases. So that is something that I would say we should keep in mind. 
uh, orbital rb is still uh, in india one of the main uh, reasons that uh, we do have pay people who end up exenterating uh, we've had patients right early in my career here i was sent to orbital rbs for exenteration but we don't of course uh, the exenteration is almost gone what we do is intraocular tumors such as these we don't see a lot of uveal or orbital uveal melanomas, but we've definitely had uh, a few cases where they've come to us like this. Then we've had squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva. So this is something that we did see. There was a trend where we saw a lot of uh, conjunctival squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, and as in the previous papers, you've seen that, uh, you know, squamous cell carcinoma was very common. Uh, of course, along with eyelid, squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. Sebaceous so and carcinoma, which is uh, probably the commonest tumor what we see in India. However, having said that, uh, we don't actually, we haven't actually exenterated too many uh, sebaceous gland carcinomas. We've just done two, uh, but squamous cell carcinomas, because they've been operated elsewhere, then they come back to us with recurrences, not having had any other treatment necessarily. Those are the ones we see. Then lacrimal gland tumors is another indication we've had. However, similarly, even these we've moved away because you can give uh, neoadjuvant treatment followed by then uh, an excision or if required an exenteration. And of course, COVID which changed everything and suddenly brought exenteration into the forefront. We used to do it for mucor, but the way it changed in 2021 where suddenly we were exenterating, especially in the uh, initial first wave between in 2020 till the second wave. Uh, second wave, of course, we discovered transorbital amphotericin and that changed it and all, along with debridement. But in the first wave, even we did, ended up doing quite a few uh, exenterations. So coming to that, what are the type of exenterations that we see? So first is a total eyelid uh, sacrifice exenteration. So we'll come to the, uh, you know, the detailed view of it later, uh, but this is just to show that the incision is actually taken along the brow, basically along the entire orbital margin. So when you say total, what it means is when you make the incision, yeah, everything is removed, including the eyelids and the conjunctiva. There is nothing that is spared, and it just leaves a socket, which needs to be reconstructed with various techniques. Second is subtotal or eyelid sparing. So we're keeping it very simple because it's just to get you all oriented. So you have an incision which is made three to four millimeters, which is subsidiary going like a spindle along the entire upper and lower eyelid and coming over the medial campus and joining. As you can see, there is a lesion here in the gentleman I showed you. So this incision is too close. I would have gone further four millimeters. The advantages with doing an eyelid sparing in older patients is that you do have a significant amount of lax tissue, which gives you that little freedom and luxury of going beyond even a lesion here, further down from the most palpable margin and still being able to do a subtotal or an eyelid sparing exenteration. Extended exenterations usually involve an incision which is either total or eyelid sparing, along with a removal of one of the walls if required. So in uh, COVID-associated mucor, uh, we often had to, didn't even have to do it because the median walls used to be so badly uh, damaged because of the you know invasive mucor that there was no question of doing it, but it was kind of almost like every case that we ended up doing, either the floor or the medial wall was an extended form of exenteration. Now, these are the two broad classifications. However, given the fact of the extent of where the tumor is, we have further now classified it into total or anterior or partial, which basically means here is a axial CT scan of a lacrimal gland tumor, which has filled the entire orbit. So we can do an eyelid sparing, but we, can have, we will have to remove the entire contents of the orbit as is described in exenteration, where you remove everything right up to orbital apex. But in some cases of anterior tumor, as is seen here, which was a squamous cell carcinoma and had gotten adherent to the globe and had a medial extension into the orbit and the eyelid, 
you could actually do what was an anterior or a partial exenteration, leaving a stump of posterior orbital tissue. And this is called as partial exenteration. So this is just a comparative of the different CT scans to show you that one is the approach anteriorly and then is posteriorly how much tissue you actually end up excising. Another one which I came up with actually was uh, while I was actually, uh, this is uh, from a craniomandular facial journal. And it's nice, but I sometimes think that things which are simplified uh, are more uh, sort of, uh, you know, over uh, uh, classified. However, I thought that given that this covers all types of classification, this is important to know that this is a type of classification that MaxFax people sometimes use, which is based on what you remove. So, orbital exudation, which is top type 1, along with removing one wall and rim, and along with removing more than one or two walls, that's type 2B. 3 is a terional craniotomy, where you're also maybe involving a roof along with the skull base. So, this is something we did see and need to combine and sometimes do with ENT or the neurosurgeons when we were treating uh, mucor. Uh, during COVID. And the last one was an extended orbital exenteration. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, extended orbital exenteration. So this is just to know if you need to do another classification, you can do it. These usually type 4 also was another one which we saw. We don't necessarily see these so much in tumors, but we definitely did see it in mucor. Because a lot of times the origin is either from the ethmoids or the maxillary sinus and they were already destroyed and uh, either you had to reconstruct it in a certain way or had to, the bones were so badly ischemic and damaged that you needed to just exenterate whatever you can do and go back in and divide it over and over again. So type 4 was not something that I used to do a lot or see also till we had COVID. So when we are talking now about the technique of surgery, it basically involves three further things. It involves the extent of orbital invasion or the disease process, the biological behavior, which also involves the pathology, and not really perineural invasion, but invasion to the surrounding structures, such as the sinuses, which determines you know, the kind of exenteration we do and the reconstruction we do. So based on this, I really like this uh, sort of algorithm which was there. So I'm just going to take you through it because it's quite extensive. But it literally summarizes almost everything that we need to know. Because each one has so much details and pluses and minuses and advantages and disadvantages. But this basically tells you. So if you do a total exenteration or an orbital exenteration, the first is spontaneous granulation by secondary hygiene takes time, but it does well. And usually uh, it does look very disfiguring, but this is what used to be done earlier. Split thickness skin grafts is something commonly done by a lot of MaxPath and uh, plastic surgeons. However, it's something we sometimes very rarely we've done it along with the plastic surgeon or they've called me and said, do you think we can do an eyelid? And then if it's not worked out on table, then we've sometimes they prefer to do a split thickness. It's not something I'm very fond of. Uh, the dermis graft again is a type of reconstruction which people use it's not something I've used then of course we come to the different flaps which I've got diagrams later which is the gallial flap and the temporalis fascia flap the eyelid sparing one is the direct closure with the lich flaps which we will come to step by step surgical steps uh, these also describe the type of socket you get which is actually important however uh, it's not necessary that you will always uh, get a very, you know, um, bulky socket with eyelid. You often get a, quite a good socket with an eyelid sparing exaggeration. Then you call on to regional and free flaps. So I just summarized it further simply. What we commonly do is local is spontaneous or a split thickness skin graft. Temporalis muscle I don't do it. I usually do it combined with my plastic surgeon. Temporoparietal facial flap and of course free flaps. 
So this is a, a, a very nice article published by Dr. Kasturi in which she did a combination of a temporalis muscle flap. And this is a diagrammatic representation of how the, and followed it with a spit thickness graph. Now, while these are good and this is the exenterated socket and the scar doesn't leave much line and you can even do it a little bit in the pretracheal area, I would only reserve this for those patients in at least in what we do, in which we genuinely cannot get a local myocutaneous flap in the form of an eyelid sparing exenteration. Often, we even go up all the way and pull down the brows so that there is a little bit of uh, you know mismatch with the brows but get enough either from the lower eyelid or the upper eyelid. Yes, if it's a young patient, then sometimes that becomes a challenge. But the reason I put this is because it's an oculoplastic surgeon who has done it with uh, her team and I think the results are comparable. Uh, it's not always necessary that you get such good results in smooth thickness skin grafts. So uh, we tend to stay away from it. Coming to the technique of uh, my choice and even in all mucors, tumors, uh, we have uh, always, I have always preferred to do this, this technique. So I don't have a video, but I thought that it would be nice to take you all through a step-by-step. -step. So first is, this is the subciliary incision. So this was obviously a uh, ocular surface as in a conjunctival tumor. So I was planning to do what was like a partial, but goes further to the orbital apex. So you can do a suture transfer after using a 4-0 Mercil. The reason for doing this is just so that you can, you know, tie the eyelids together and get a good traction when you're in, about to remove, uh, remove the entire orbital contents. Uh, and the incisions are made. Now, like we discussed, if there is any little lesion here, like we do extended uniquelations, you can further take a margin away from it. The main thing is that you want to leave that 4mm so as to, you know, get a good incision away from it and not break through the eyelid. I saw one technique where uh, they were doing, um, leaving, uh, splitting the eyelid and leaving a part of the conjunctiva. But when you do do that, sometimes you create a pocket and that can lead to a cyst formation and a continuous drainage, which is not really good. So this is, uh, you have to remove the entire contents, including, this is what I prefer, including the eyelid, the conjunctiva. So this is the diagrammatic representation uh, taken from, uh, I think, Shield's articles of eyelid sparing. Once you made the transverse incision, the next is, this is, it is the surgeon's view. As you can see, this is the brow. This is what we've done. We've dissected suborbicularis, which basically means you're creating a myocutaneous flap which you already have with the eyelids. So this is the margin which we've left behind. And you've dissected superiorly and the spatula is placed here to show you the superior orbital margin. And that's where you go. And then take an incision about 4 millimeters superior to the orbital margin so as to get, you know, dissect through all the orbital tissues and reach the periosteum so that you have 4 millimeters away so as to get a clean uh, sort of clearance 360 degrees which is done. So this will be done 360 degrees here so as to release it. I was actually, I did, I had actually put a couple of slides to show the anatomy about how you do it when you dissect it. However, I took those off because I realized that the next lecture which is going to be is obviously going to be a, a amazing lecture on orbital anatomy. So I think it's a good correlation to do that. However, it's very important to know your orbital anatomy. So whenever we have exenterations, I actually tell my residents, please read your orbital anatomy and come because it's a live view. And I'm sure all of your residents also, I mean, all of your fellows also must be knowing that it's literally like learning your anatomy in one go and knowing where, which vessel comes where, where your NLD, where you need to excise it, you know your measurements, the measurements of, you know, your uh, anterior, posterior, ethmoids, your optic canal, 6, 12, 24, all the, all the measurements, all the algorithms, you learn it in an exenteration. So often we get the residents together to do this. The next step is you have to hold the stitches and strangely this photograph has come with someone's hand in between. So this, you have to hold it and you start dissecting towards the orbit, taking care of all the blood vessels and nerves in their respective foramina and uh, uh, place. And you deliver it. You only leave the stump behind. 
if it's a very very vascular or a tumor which is extending right to the posterior orbit and i need to go i do take a long bipolar cautery which they use for general surgery and i just do a 360 degrees cautery around the stump that i want to cut and uh, it's not a very aggressive one because you want that tissue also not to get charred and then you go in with an enucleation scissors and you cut it so this is after the entire uh, lesion has been removed and this is what you will see so this is your local myocutaneous or your orbicularis flap this is the bone showing a good clean edge and this is the posterior orbital tissue which i have left behind with a little bleeding once you've removed it you can pack it nicely and you can uh, also you don't need to soak it in too much saline and make it wet and ice there are a lot of articles but you just need to pack it nicely give it a good pressure and honestly if you've taken care of everything uh, including a hypotensive anesthesia reverse tendinal birth you will not have excessive bleeding uh, so this also involves that you do a good, you know tell your anesthetist that i would like it to be hypotensive yes one more thing that i did learn also from dr navar was that when we used to have anterior segment tumor sometimes uh, you know we just uh, either put uh, a little light gauze in between the eyelids so as to protect the tumors when you you know pulling you may cause a little traction so as to keep it protected so this is how the socket looks following this the whole lesion goes for pathology sometimes if you feel like what i showed in the gentleman that you have a lesion which is anterior you want to take out another sort of sliver of skin and send it separately along with the muscle if you want for frozen section now i have the advantage of having a frozen section so we do send it but that depends on person to person so i mean from institute to institute so since we have it we sometimes send it if it's a A eyelid tumor or an ocular surface tumor, which is coming very close to the margin, and then once you've got a clearance, so once you've achieved hemostasis, the layers are closed. Uh, first orbicularis using five six zero um uh bicrin, uh as you can see here. So I prefer to take uh, all interrupted stitches so that if it's not continuous, so that if one breaks, it doesn't open up the whole thing, and that is how it looks. when it is closed so it's a very neat clean wound and for this i usually use 60 mercil sometimes i do use 50 if i feel there is a little bit of attraction on my wound and that is how it looks and that's exactly how the socket looks so this is an exenterated socket of course you don't need to really have an orientation because you can make out medial and lateral catheters but if there's anything specific you want you should mark it out over i always leave a uh, a little bit of a thing marking so medial canthus will have a short suture and i leave a long for the lateral just so that the pathologists know that the minute they get it that this is the lateral end this is at one week post op and this is actually at one month now coming to the socket unfortunately i didn't find any pictures of me so either you can put a drain like a vacuum small mini vac I never did that during my fellowship. But when I came here, I was quite intrigued, and I thought, okay, I don't need to aspirate it along. Sometimes you need to aspirate it. But I actually had such a tight socket where the mini vac was draining it that I ended up having in the second week a little bit of opening of my wound because there was a constant vacuum and suction, and it did not allow the granulation to form. After I used it once, I never went back to using mini vac, but it may work in certain people's hands. so complications that we see usually are a uh, fistula formation into the sinus the nose of the you know and we've seen now with covid we've seen so many of these that we've learned how to manage them uh, often the sutures can break you can have tissue necrosis uh, uh, and it can give away and not heal especially in long standing diabetics you can have an inspection infection and of course sometimes if you've been very aggressive or you need to remove the medial wall you can also have a csf leak uh there is uh, articles uh, also about this however in exenteration we ne i've never had a csf leak so this is to show that this was uh, as you can see it, it is uh, about, about two weeks post operative and the patient developed a bleed into the wound and as you can see there's a little hemorrhage there luckily we were able to salvage it i did not take any sutures but this is also something that can occur in the complication the second is that you can get a opening like this uh, where uh, it just gives way and it starts opening and then you need to go in 
refreshen the edges and suture it and hopefully if it's a clean wound it will heal back but often sometimes it gives away and as you can see there's this extra so this is the patient which opened up after uh, so radiation any adjuvant therapy which is done usually we start like radiation four weeks later so after about two weeks into his radiation it came, became a small hole and it became bigger and bigger and uh I tried to go back and do it again about after four weeks after radiation was completed. But every time it gave away and we never could really treat this. And finally, we just gave him a prosthesis over this. And I will show you this case later. So rehabilitation, of course, is as simple as putting on a patch. But that's really for patients who may not want anything. You know, sometimes in the villages, they don't really care. So, but it is very important to uh, get it rehabilitated. An ocularist usually does this. Am I okay on time? So, so, okay. Am I okay on time? Okay. So basically, you can do it is done usually by an ocularist. And uh, please tell me huh, if I need to. So this is how usually a wax model is made. And using this wax model and doing the same acrylic eye like we do for enucleation and evisceration, an exenteration prosthesis is made. Now, exenteration prosthesis also can be with. Uh, you know, where you can have uh, either uh, spectacle mounted glued, but abroad it's very popular to basically, you know, have stick on like magnetic prosthesis. However, uh, neither have my three, four uh, ocularists ever done it. Neither have an eye, have I, and uh, also it's a far more expensive process uh, and uh, it's not something I've ever tried and have any experience, uh, but it is, it is an option that is done. So this is a classical spectacle mounted prosthesis, which you see. Uh, where it is stuck on or tied to the thing and it looks very real or you can have just a glued prosthesis where they use a specific type of medical glue in which you can put it onto the socket especially if the socket is well healed coming to a few cases uh, so this is a case of a uh, mucor as you can see the orbit is sinuses and it was covid mucor was uh, you know one of those things which you may have got a uh, ethmoid sinus one little sinus but then the eye was just gone so this the, the boy actually did not have any vision, came to us with a CRAO and a completely frozen orbit uh, with a total ptosis and I had to exenterate him. So unfortunately, he started developing a little bit of an opening about three months post uh, the exenteration where we did eyelid sparing. However, we took him back, debrided it and resutured it and it was okay. So this is the kind of results you get. This is an 18-year-old boy who came with a rapidly growing conjunctival tumor and I did an incisional biopsy because we couldn't figure. This was when he came to me on the fifth day from the village. The first day when he came, it wasn't even so large. And it turned out to be an amelanotic conjunctival melanoma. That was how it looked. This is him at 10 days. This is him at five weeks. And this is him almost, I think now it's actually, it's been almost an eight-year follow-up and giving an exenteration processes. So you do need to rehabilitate them for their confidence. Even if they're in the village, you need to counsel them so that they can wear it. And of course, protective glasses over that. This is again a squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva. So the reason I put this is one, the patient did not want a prosthesis. So he just wanted a pair of glasses. Then I convinced him to get uh, frosted, which even also he didn't want. So he decided. So there are some patients who don't mind having a socket. And also it looks quite clean. And this is to show how it would look once it healed. So as when you see, you can actually see that this granulation tissue heals the socket so and it lines it really well. We've also seen this uh, not initially in the mucor, but later on we see at uh, three, at, I mean at six months that the exenterated socket heals really well. This is a case that I showed you again of the intraocular choroidal melanoma, which had become an uh, orbital lesion and this is post and this is how it had healed. And again, this gentleman did not want to wear it, but chose to wear tinted glasses. So whatever works for everybody, but a form of rehabilitation and counseling is very important. So coming to just a very brief summary is that uh, we, in my practice, till COVID happened, we were seeing basically eyelid conjunctival tumors, which we were exenterating, orbital tumors, not so much. Lacrimal gland tumors, there was a, initially I used to see quite a lot, but now we don't because also there is better, you can give consider, you know, neoadjuvant treatments. Uh, my choice is still eyelid sparing. Uh, even in eyelid tumors, we try to maneuver, we try to do or eyelid sparing with a flap 
so that we still manage to get a little bit uh, of the eyelid uh, mucocutaneous flap. Uh, secondly, uh, usually uh, we've had in our uh, cases, we've had a good five year survival rate. However, um, we do a close follow up because a lot of times uh, we've had patients, not so much of the tumors, but especially mucor coming to us with complications. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for covering this topic. Uh, since we have some more time left, I would like you to just touch up on the other methods of in excentration, which is not eyelid sparing, and how to uh, proceed to get a good cosmetic outcome after that. So, uh, basically, a total eyelid excentration is the only other one I've done literally once, uh, which is basically you take an incision subbrow and you go around and you... Take out the process remains the same, but here you've taken it uh, uh, just sort of a little inner to the uh, brow, and uh, then you just leave it for spontaneous healing, or you can use a flap with a skin graft, uh, split thin, a split thickness skin graft. So uh, initially, uh, I was very like intrigued to do it, and did a few with my plastic surgeon till I saw the results, and the socket becomes so dry and tight that even for a prosthesis to fit, it becomes a little bit of a challenge. So we try not to do it. We try to do an eyelid sparing, but I've literally done one total exenteration. Uh, talking about extended exenterations, like I said in my talk, there are cases where you already uh, have those, in, especially in mucor, where the median wall and the floor are gone. So in those cases, it's not the exenteration, which is so much of a challenge because it's just removing dead tissue, uh, bones. It is the reconstruction which is a challenge because uh, along with the ENT uh, or a max pack surgeon, sometimes you need to put an obturator so as to separate the two cavities. Either it is done in the same sitting uh, based on the disease which is involved. Uh, of course, if it is tumors, you can reconstruct it then uh, because you are planning a juvenile therapy. Uh, but in mucormycosis, often we did not do it in the first sitting if the diseases were extensive and was taken as a secondary reconstruction. Thank you. Uh, do, you, you do you do, does, uh, I mean, in in the whatever you all are seeing, have you all ever seen total exenterations, even in, say, um, when during the COVID uh, phase? Yes, ma'am. During COVID, we saw quite a few. Uh... No, you all saw, but were you all doing the total exenterations? Uh... Or with still, because we tried... Most of our uh, mucor patients, we still tried eyelid sparing. We said, okay, if it opens up, we'll see. But we were just giving eyelids because the eyelids in very few cases were really involved so much. For uh, It was more the eyeballs and the orbit. So we basically stuck to. There were cases where the palate was also involved. So there was like a single cavity directly going from the palate to the orbit. So in those cases, eyelid sparing was uh, uh, like that was the last uh, year so everything was kind of removed and the patient also came later and like uh, uh, customized processes was made to prevent now, otherwise he was having difficulty eating too yes because of the year um, i'm coming to the next question uh and what is the uh, can you speak on the spectrum i think you've covered this but i'll just say yes. it out still the spectrum of post excentration rehabilitation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think I think uh, so. Usually, uh, so for, let's just take what we described eyelid sparing excentration. Uh, once you remove the sutures at one week, uh, usually the healing takes place maximum by four to five weeks. You get a clean socket provided you've not had any, you know, suture breakage. So an excentration process, whether it's a stick on uh, or a spectacle mounted, which is not an issue, you can actually rehabilitate the patient within the first after five weeks itself so it's a quick rehabilitation however uh, there are cases where if you have to you know uh, there will be well in, we ended up having those cases in mucor that the patient's socket just opened up and uh, we really couldn't do anything so we used to wait for a period of uh, six to eight weeks and then we would give spectacle mounted processes uh, Otherwise, we would just wait for it to just do a spontaneous granulation and then only consider again spectacle uh, mounted processes, really, or a patch. There were quite a few people at that time who did not even want to go ahead with the uh, exemplary I mean, processes. 
but at least we give them frosted glasses, tinted glasses, or them a spectacle mount or prosthesis. Ma'am, in such cases, if there's like a, a dehiscence of the wound and there's a like the hole, the one with the hole you had shown. So in these cases, uh, like how long to wait till we do we do any secondary intervention or do we just let it heal granul uh, with granulation? Uh, because one, if you notice, uh, I'm just going to share this one slide, just one minute because I want to just show. I think I forgot to mention it. Uh, yes, of course. You no, know, the reason I'm saying it is the exactly what you're asking. Now I just I just skip through that slide. See this slide of that gentleman here. Can you see? Yes, ma'am. So he actually still has the uh, he still has the dehiscence. Okay. Yeah, so first we tried, um, that's actually him. And so I uh, initially was like, no, we cannot put a prosthesis. So yeah. what uh, the ocularis did was, we put a prosthesis, which are glued on prosthesis, because he was not comfortable with spectacle mounted. And we actually left that area. So he gave him a support around it. And the area which was dehiscent, he made a little hollow so that it wouldn't rub against the wound. So obviously, in on a... Honestly, I did not even think of taking a picture that time. Because I was just very happy that, that the ocularis came up with such a unique idea. And so now there are so many more techniques. One of ocularists has come with 3D digitally printed, uh, you know, Sachin has come out with 3D, uh, I mean, not 3D, uh, like a digital printed processes stuck onto the glasses, which is taken from your normal eye, uh, which may, mimics it. So it actually looks like it gives it that 3D effect. So he's done, he presented that paper and it looks really good and uh, he's working on how to be able to they bring that out. So it's actually just a sticker, but it gives it that 3D image. So that's one of the th other things we can do. Coming back to that question, so if there is a dehiscence, I usually wait to see that there is no discharge, there's no mucus, try to repair it. If it doesn't, then often we leave it alone. I have had a few cases where it is spontaneously resolved It is if it hasn't. After eight to ten weeks, I at least still consider doing a spectacle mounted prosthesis, so that they don't really you don't have to go all the way and touch the uh, dehiscence for the opening, and you can be a little short of that. So we I actually we didn't see too many of these, you know, during my initial year. It is only in mucor that we will be realize that oh my god, I've done a good surgery. Why is it not happening? Why is it not happening? And when everyone came together, we realized everyone was having these challenges because it was so ischemic and destroyed and necrotic that those flaps were also not really mm -hmm. uh, healing. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, what is the role of, in case of uh, profuse bleeding during such a surgery, uh, what is the most uh, optimum way of hemostasis and the role of electrocautery in exentration surgery? Yeah. So, um, basically, uh, we I tend to use, I, we don't use, of course, monopolar when you're cauterizing the stump of the uh, uh, ophthalmic and uh, optic nerve because you're not supposed to ideally use a, a monopolar cautery because uh, it can, there is a phenomena which it can transmit. So we use a bipolar. So the first thing that we do is that if it is an anterior tumor and I have the comfort of say using a long, uh, like a long uh, bipolar, which is what general surgeons use, just before I remove the stump, I just, the stump, I just do a 360 degree cautery around the posterior orbital tissues. And then I cut it, which reduces the amount of immediate bleeding. Uh, then we pack it, uh, just like I said, they are soaked gauze, but not dripping or wet or ice. They're just soaked in dry gauze, which we put two, three, and we pack it down. If the bleeding still continues, go back, find the bleeder, uh, again, go in and, you know, cauterize it. Uh, I, uh, only once in our fellowship, actually, uh, and I said, may remember this, that we had one case where it was an old lady, not on blood thinners, nothing, but for some reason just continued to bleed and took really long time, tamponade, cautery, tamponade, cautery. It was the only case we actually ended up giving a uh, transfusion intraoperatively. But other than that, uh, never had to even, uh, we don't really uh, end up keeping even uh, blood standby to, you know, transfuse. So it's just a combination of a meticulous dissection, a knowing where your vessel's anatomy is and when you're coming to the orbital apex to do a combination of cautery and pressure. I'm not a big fan of leaving anything in the orbit. Sometimes there are cases where you put gel foam and this and that and 
uh, surgery, uh, you know, surgical uh, goals, which uh, I don't like leaving anything uh, in the orbit. I feel I wait and we see that the bleeding completely stops. Once the bleeding has completely stopped, the hypotensive anesthesia is brought up slowly. So as to see there's no further bleeding. And only then do we close the wound very gently. And the uh, PT is, of course, brought up to a level where we know that we're not going to expect. Next day, post-op, of course, having said that, you still need to aspirate it. So like I mentioned, uh, we do, uh, which I feel is a little more complicated for uh, postgraduates, but we, of course, go with the syringe and aspirate the uh, blood for the first three to four days, the secret sanguinous blood, which is there. Uh, and like I said, my personal experience with the mini vac was, you know, I didn't like it because it Mom just... Is is aspiration necessary for all post-operative no, or is just after, like, what do we assess and then decide on? So if your uh, cavity is nicely concave and is not boggy or bulky, mm -hmm. and then you do not need to do it. But if you do feel there is some amount of bogginess or bulkiness, then you need to go in and aspirate, sometimes maybe for the first two to three days. Uh, you know, with uh, the syringe. And ma'am, what should be the ideal site of uh, aspiration? So I usually prefer to make the patient be in like a 40 degrees uh, semi-reclined position. And uh, uh, obviously the site is at either infero temporarily or infero medially. Usually you don't even need to put anything because the patients don't have much sensation. Go, you don't need to scratch the floor, but you go, uh, you know, parallel to the floor at the most dependent portion of the bogginess. And you go in with the needle. Uh, usually I prefer to use either a, a 21 or a 22. That works well for me with a 10 cc syringe and gently aspirate, so in the most dependent part of the orbit. Um, if in case uh, gel foam is used uh, to, you know, manage, <laughs> so what is the precautions to be taken or how early is, you know, what should be done in such a case? You can leave it behind, but I just feel like it's not like the nose, you know, where you can go and yank it out. Unless, of course, you have a massive cavity where you can go in and see the I mean, a lot of the mucors that we did when there was a big sinoorbital cavity, uh, you know, and we really had to pack it. Yeah, I mean, endoscopically, you can go and peep into the orbit and see if there was anything uh, was oozing or anything. So, in those cases, of course, it's far more simpler to just go in with an endoscope and review it. Okay, oh, and actually, uh, I forgot to talk about anyway, that's okay. I don't know how I think I had saved it because I thought I might go over time, but I had, it's okay. I talked about endoscopic orbital exemplation, which is there's a paper on it uh, about how you can uh, go through endoscopic and you know debride it. But I'm, I, I've never seen one being done. I just thought I'd mention it for the. For and so in that, like the all the tissues are removed endoscopically and. Yeah, with a debrider, and uh, uh, it's they basically sometimes leave the eyeball and debride the tissues around it. But that's not something uh, I've ever seen being done. But there was a big discussion about this during mucor also. So ma'am, it is done only in cases of mucor or we can do it in all our uh, first I'll like... Paper, uh... I'll share the paper with you. I'll share the sure. paper. Actually, I put it then I said it might get delivered. So there was a big discussion during mucor that would it be okay to leave the eyeball if the disease process was in the ethmoids and around and just debride and then we decided that no, if you're going to do it, we'll go and, we'll go and do an orbital debridement through an orbital approach, whatever fauna I show is that instead of doing a posterior endoscopic approach and just actually go in through a direct approach, divide that tissue, come out if required, go in again and divide it. So in that, just out of curiosity, since it is, uh, yeah. so the eyeball is left, the ocular part is left intact and the, it's not, or... It's, it's not, it, it's, it's, there are certain specific indications in that. So only in those cases, can you consider and those are considered like like partial exaggerations what we were talking about That's so there was one other article in which uh, which again I thought it was a bit too much right now for postgraduates where they are doing exaggerations where you know it's kind of like removing like an enucleation plus removing some of the tissues but leaving you know a little bit of the conjunctiva and uh, you know creating so that is it's a recent publication which even I found but I feel that if you're going to do an exenteration and you don't want to leave anything which creates any sort of mucus or creates a scavity because as it is dealing with, you know, you want a clean wounds which can get a good prosthesis. And after, I think, our primary indications are tumors and obviously COVID changed that and we 
in maximum examinations. But uh, we got them in such different forms that we had to sort of, you know, go with the flow and learn examination with different openings, openings up. Sometimes it will be in the inferior orbital margin. The wound will be okay. We get a little opening here. We get sometimes an opening here. Sometimes medially there will be a dehiscence. So I, you just learn to debride suture, debride suture, refresh the wounds. Especially the really, the, one, the ones which were, which we did in the first wave, came like classical examinations. Sinuses, sinuses, and then eyeball. But the second wave was like one anterior ethmoid and eyeball. Then one mm -hmm. posterior orbit, nothing in the anterior orbit but the eyes. So those, of course, we tried not to, and TRAM was a big help. Yes, ma'am. Hopefully, we don't have to come across that time again. I, I absolutely agree. Ma'am, one question I had was uh, in cases uh, of uh, extended excentration, uh, how do we manage the uh, CSF leak, which is often encountered? Uh... Yeah, so CSF leak uh, is like a bit like suppose you're doing an orbital decompression, or you know, you're doing a medial wall decompression or this. So it is a bit like if it is a small leak. Uh, then you want to see if you can, you know, uh, pack it with uh, surgery seal or you want to pack it with, uh, you can't, obviously, if, they, if it's an anterior tumor, you can pack it with the fat from the orbit. Uh, if it is, a little, and also a little bit of pressure sometimes stops it enough, then pack it with anything that you can get. But if it's a bigger CSF leak, then often that you need for a ENT surgeon to sometimes come in and actually go in and close it and suture it or, you know, put a little graft so I've just had that once, but for a decompression, not for an examination. So Ma'am, in a case of uh, known healing uh, uh, socket, where uh, in suppose in a case of uh, total excentration, when we feel that there is a unhealthy infective uh, tissue, like how do we treat it? How do we manage it? Uh, local dressing, which antibiotics uh, should be given, and uh, culture sensitivity is it really required? Secondary infection. Yes, ma'am. Secondary infected sockets, uh, usually, yes, you have to uh, probably do a broad spectrum antibiotic, go and debride the tissue. Uh, you're going to counsel the patient that, you know, you're going to have to leave the socket open to review it. Uh, one of the simple things that actually I learned with SH was that, which I tend to do even now, is sometimes if I feel that there is this little bit of early infection setting is that we dilute or use a diluted betadine and flush the sockets. Uh, even if it's open and allow it, you know, or there's a small dehiscence, open it and allow it to drain. But the main thing is doing a, a broad antibiotic cover, uh, debriding if required, uh, you know, and flushing the orbital cavity with the uh, beta -beam. And uh, then you have to leave it for spontaneous granulation. Unfortunately, you may not be able to uh, close the socket with anything. I was... Uh, Initially, because we had only been trained in eyelid eyelid sparing initially, we were very averse to spontaneous granulation. But then you realize that while it does take time, some patients heal really well. They do really heal well. You know, and sometimes it's the only option, but it it comes together. And ma'am, what is your usual protocol? Like, uh, which all medications you used post-op? Like, uh, do you give Tranexa for three days, oral Tranexa? And uh, which all antibiotics uh, you uh, start? So, I don't know. Uh, if it's uh, any of the tumors, uh, you know, trauma, even I've never done an examination. Uh, tumors, we've done one very severe case of uh, orbital inflammation only once, one time. Which was all in the opposite was I remember it was like a wedge nose, which was very bad. So and it was mainly for pain, and the patient was willing. We tried everything, but uh, my thing is that initially, if there are any blood thinners or whatever it's worth, we stop it. Uh, if it's a patient where I'm anticipating that is going to bleed, we do keep uh, uh, you know if we want uh, the packed blood cells or. But we don't necessarily, but because I'm having a multi speciality, I can cross match and have the luxury of you know just doing a cross match and keeping it and then having just saying that okay, I may need this, uh, as versus an eye institute. Um, I don't uh, really uh, give any other drugs, 
uh, intraoperatively, we do give uh, painkillers in the form of uh, just for thousand or cocerin, which is one gram. And postoperatively, we continue that. I don't even tend to give any steroids. And uh, usually, we start the blood thinners by the fifth day uh, of it. And uh, antibiotics are usually I stick to either uh, you know third generation cephalosporins or or a combination like an uh, you know augmentin. And that usually works with uh, sources. And of course, if it's mucor, then it's a whole different ball game. We're antifungals. So we've not even gone to like very high antibiotics. These are our two drugs of choice. Uh, and that's what we do. One more thing that I would definitely like to mention to anybody who's listening is, of course, for enucleation and evisceration, we do take special concerns. But uh, we have an exenteration special concern because I feel that exenteration is another further radical surgery than evisceration mutation. So in our exenteration consent, uh, we have very specifically written all these things that there is a possibility of dehiscence, there's a possibility of recurrence, there's debridement, breaking down, wound, and that you will have to be rehabilitated anywhere between six weeks to eight weeks. So I think consent is also something that's extremely important taking before you exenteration. I mean, we all do it, but I think it's very important to also uh, just, I'm just putting this out there that it needs to be mentioned. Yes, ma'am, that was... Under general anesthesia, so. That was a very good pointer, ma'am. And uh, how do we manage the post-op wound gap, uh, uh, post uh, lead sparing uh, exenteration? So, uh, it's primarily just cleaning daily uh, with either Johnson buds with distilled water and a simple antibiotic on ointment either moxifloxacin, ciprofloxacin uh, for a period of uh, two weeks. At one week, we do the suture removal and that uh, I keep the ointment on for two weeks after which I stop. And uh, antibiotic orally, which we give uh, with painkillers for a period of only seven days and then we stop. So usually the tumors, even if they're necrot necrotic, we are not, uh, they're usually, even even the patients we've had from come from the villages like that boy, he actually came with a tumor that was half the size. If I show you the sequence, it was like he came in second day, third day, then he went for two days, stitching around. And then that was the photo when he came on the 10th day, which had doubled in size like that. And uh, I remember even at that time discussing it, I think with SH saying that a squamous cell carcinoma, Renzo is beyond me. And then, of course, it was a melanotic melanoma, so it fell into place. Mm -hmm. But um, even the infected ones, which are necrotic, uh, those also do well, you know, once you've done a clean exemplation. The only ones which are a challenge are a new call. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a very interesting lecture and we thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Over like to I'm you, Dr. Titi. I'm feeling like I'm giving an exam. <laughs> Morning, no. special class. I'd just like to make an announcement about the international masterclass which we have on November 22nd, which will be taken by none other than uh, the world famous Dr. Jonathan Dutton, who's going to speak on the anatomy of the orbit. So I hope everyone will join in that day. And thank you so much again, ma'am, for this wonderful lecture. So much, I 